Well, Merry Christmas. I hope that you are all ready and excited for the season. And uh, we just want to welcome you to Impact. I hope that this service so far has been an encouragement to you as we continue on with this service, that it will be an encouragement to you. If this is your first time, we just want to welcome you. In the seat back in front of you, there's a Connect card. We'd love you to fill that out and put in the offering containers on your way out. And online, there's, there's a place where you can click right now because we'd love to learn more how we can meet your needs and pray for you and be there for you. But also, we'd love to keep you in touch with what's going on here at Impact because Impact 20, 2022 is going to be an exciting time. God's on the move and there's many exciting things on the horizon. We'd love to keep you updated. For example, we have Stephen Curtis Chapman in concert right here on this stage March 4th and that's going to be an exciting night and you definitely want to be a part of that. You can get tickets at impactpittsburgh.com or in our cafe with more details. You don't want to miss that. The tickets are going to go super fast. You don't want to be on the outside looking in. But thank you for being here, and let's just pray as we prepare our hearts and our minds for today's message. Father in heaven, we just come to you right now, and we thank you because of how good you are. And Lord, I don't know what everybody walked into this place dealing with, whether it was a good day or bad day, a time of joy or a time of heartache, Father God. I, but I just pray right now, whatever may be going on in their lives, that we all just may lay it at your feet. And Lord, in this moment, may we just experience you in a whole new way. Father, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. I have to tell you something. When I was a kid, there was a Christmas movie that for me was a must watch. Every year, I had to watch this movie at least one time. And it was not Christmas season unless I watched this movie. And that movie was A Christmas Story. That's right, Ralphie and his quest for this Red Rider carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle. I mean, that had me hook, line, and sinker. I was rooting him on every time I watched that show. Get him it! But over and over again, he was rejected by his mom, his teacher, and even Santa Claus, who said, You'll shoot your eye out. You know, have you ever had a gift? that you were just so enthralled with, that you just had to have it, that it became your entire focus and attention and ambition. It was just something that glued you to it that you had to get and you weren't going to be satisfied until you had that gift. I mean, for you 80s kids, you might know this gift from 1980, the pogo ball. How many of you guys remember the pogo ball? That's right. And, and, and when I was in the 80s, I had to get the pogo ball. And maybe I should get those clothes, too. What do you think? I'm going to go find those for next week. But the pogo ball, I mean, the commercial had me hook, line, and sinker because I believed that if I got the pogo ball, I could jump higher than I could ever jump before. I could jump farther than you could ever imagine. I mean, I believed this thing was going to change my life, and then I got it. Then I got the pogo ball. And can I just tell you something? It wasn't as great as they sold it to be. I didn't jump any higher than I thought I could. I couldn't jump any farther than I could. In fact, most of the time, I found myself flat on my face. It just wasn't that great. And can I just be real with you today? The world that we live in has has become so commercialized with everything. You know, This world is constantly, in its commercialization of everything, is constantly trying to get us to buy into the hype of whatever it's trying to sell us. Whether it's a product or a lifestyle, this world is constantly trying to sell us something that if you get this, if you become this, whatever it may be, then you will be happy. Then your joy will be complete. Then you will be satisfied. And you know, this world everywhere we turn, is trying to sell us something, trying to get us into the hype from something. And because of all this, everybody lies. Through all the commercialization that is this world, we are bombarded with dishonesty. You see, my friends, our over-commercialized world is saturated with dishonesty. And here we lie in the middle of it. And so often, we're so overwhelmed with the influence of the, of the dishonesty and the commercialization of this world, we carry it everywhere we go in this little rectangular device that's so often in our pocket. And before we know it, we have become so influenced by YouTube, by Instagram, by Snapchat, and whatever else you may pull up on your phone. 
that's constantly trying to sell us something and trying to overdramatize uh, what will bring us happiness or joy in our life, trying to find satisfaction in our life, and is saying, if you just do this, then you'll be happy. But so often through the lies, the world is just trying to sell us something that they want from us, not necessarily what we get from them. And then here we are, sold out in this world, a dog-eats-dog world. And did you know that the Bible even talks about this? Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, when he says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Paul's saying, we need to be careful because we live in a world that's constantly trying to sell us something and pull us away from what God has for us. You know, these influencers get a hold of our hearts, masking as something good, something that will complete our joy. And this world is so full of dishonesty and selfish ambition and broken ta- promises that only steals our joy. And over and over again, in what the world is trying to sell us, through, uh, weaved all through it, the world is constantly trying to eliminate Jesus out of the picture to become a me-focused happiness. And if we're not careful, we get bought into the lies of this world that we become more happy the more focused we are of ourself. And is that really where joy is found? You know, slowly and methodically, we walk down this path and it only develops more and more darkness in our life and all around us. And you see, Jesus was born into this world. In the same situation that we deal with today, Jesus was born into then. Jesus was born into darkness, and he brought the marvelous light. See, Jesus is light brought into this dark world that we've surrounded ourselves with, that we've become so overwhelmed with. And here's the struggle. Sometimes our lives get so overwhelmed with darkness, and we get beaten down by the brokenness, whether what we're experiencing in our life or within the world all around us. All we see is darkness. But can I just tell you something? There's many times that God shines his light the brightest in our darkest of moments. You know, in our dark times is when he comes through the brightest and the best. In fact, when Jesus was born, it was a very dark time politically and spiritually. The world was a broken place. And even when Jesus was born, the world was trying to eliminate him. And there in that dark place, in the darkest of time in all of history, the light came shining through a star. And there the star was over the sky, was in the sky. And the Magi, who we know as the wise men, saw the star. These wise men were studying this for years because they knew something was coming for them. Something that was prophesied hundreds of years before this moment took place. They saw it kind of come together in the skies. And you see, the Bible says the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that moment, the darkness was coming through, and they knew it. They knew something special was happening. But still there was darkness in the world. There was King Herod. And the Bible says in Matthew 2 that King Herod, when he heard about what was going on in Bethlehem, he was disturbed. You see, what was going on was this. There was a baby born at this time. It was at least a year, up to two years after he was born. And news started to spread all throughout the city and all throughout the countryside. And it finally got to Herod's ears. And Herod was disturbed. Do you know why? Because he did not want to lose his place as king. And so he brought in these wise men. He said, tell me, tell me, what's going on in Bethlehem? Who is this baby? What's this all about? And the wise men told him about the prophecies, about how it was supposed to come together, about what was supposed to transpire. And then Matthew chapter 2, verse 8 He, that's King Herod, sent them to Bethlehem, the wise men, and said, Go and search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. You know what? Herod was lying. He had no desire to go worship this baby. 
He was being dishonest. Why? Because he wanted what he wanted. And he was trying to portray to the wise men a, a special gain for them when in reality it was all for himself. King Herod was masquerading as something good, only manipulating what was reality to pursue his own, his own gain. He was revealing the darkness that really is in this world, the darkness that tends to be within our own heart. And then there were the wise men. The wise men, they were on a quest for something bigger than themselves. They were on the quest for something, something significant, something that was happening in Bethlehem. They were on the quest for the greatest gift this world has ever known. And they wanted to find this gift in this baby boy named Jesus who was born into this world. And they were searching for him. And they came to the realization that maybe, just maybe, this gift is not only for me to receive, but also give as as well. And so they embarked on this journey to find this baby Jesus, to celebrate him, and to give him their gifts. You see, the world is trying to tell us that to, sat, to have happiness and joy in our life, that we need to focus on ourselves, when in reality, Jesus teaches us great, the greatest joy is found not only when we receive the gift, but when we learn how to give it. You see, joy is not just found by only when, when we receive it. Joy is found when we give. That's ultimately where it is. So suppose you could give a gift to Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? If you could bring a gift to the baby Jesus, just like the wise men did. I mean, what gift could you possibly give him to this baby, this, this God who has everything and, oh, by the way, created everything? You know, the wise men were an example of what we can bring to him in our life just like they did. When they found the baby, they brought him these gifts of gold. Gold was the symbol of a king. In that moment, they're saying, you are our king. They gave him frankincense, and frankincense is the symbol of a deity or a god. And in that moment, they're saying, not only are you our king, you are something higher and greater than this world could ever imagine. You are God. And then they gave him myrrh, which is the symbol of death which is a pretty fascinating gift to give to celebrate a baby. Maybe, just maybe, they knew at that moment this baby boy was born to die. And they realized there was something special about this baby. But you know, they gave even something more than those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They gave their hope, their time, and devotion. You see, the wise men gave their hope. When everybody else just saw that dark night sky, both physically, but also emotionally and spiritually and politically, the wise men saw the star. And that star urged their hearts to seek after this baby. When night overwhelms your world, emotionally or spiritually, what do you see? Do you see darkness or light, hopelessness, or hopefulness. You see, my friends, in the darkest of moments, Jesus shines his light the brightest. And so with that being said, the wise men also gave Jesus their time. You see, they gave him their presence. And that began even before they found him in that manger in Bethlehem. Like I said, the wise men probably traveled for up to a year, maybe even two years before they found baby Jesus. And there was many moments, many months, many years that they spent searching, anticipating this coming Messiah. They gave Jesus their time. And the Bible says when we search Jesus, when we search God with all of our hearts, we will find him. And then when they found Jesus, they gave him their devotion. You know, these wise men... They weren't just a bunch of knuckleheads who just went on a whim and said, hey, something cool is happening. Let's go join the party. These guys were smart men. They were wealthy. 
They were men of influence. You know why we know that? Because King Herod, the king of the land, called them in to tell them what was going on. They were men of influence. They were men of great intellect. They spent years studying the stars and the environment and what was and, and, and the prophecies and what was supposed to happen. And these men of wealth and influence and intellect, when they saw this baby in the manger, the Bible says they worshipped him. Look how it's written in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, their devotion was to see God more clearly. And when we give God our devotion, he transforms our hearts to experience his joy completely. The wise men, they sought after this God this God who will wipe away every tear, who will take away every, every brokenness in your heart, who will soften hearts, and who will make dead men alive. But yet the world, the self-indulgent world that we live in, has a tendency just to get in the way. At that moment, an angel spoke to, to the wise men and said, don't go back to Herod. He was lying. His intentions aren't good. And you know, Herod revealed his heart. His intentions were self-driven, and he tried to manipulate the wise men, saying this is for your gain when it was really all about himself. And the world does that to us all the time. The world and the influencers of the world attempt to manipulate us for their gain. And the devil is behind the scenes working all the time, working to slowly develop darkness within our own life. The Bible says that the, the, the devil masquerades as light, trying to make things that appear to be for our benefit, for our good, when in reality they are for his own pleasures, for his own evil desires. And through his lies, we are left to believe that running towards our own hearts, our own wants, will be our gain. Yet in reality, this long run only becomes our loss. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. You see, my friends, Jesus is the greatest gain. He is. He is the ultimate gift, and he is the place where we belong. I bet it's safe to assume that we're all in the same quest in life. And that quest is this. Deep down in all of our hearts is a deep desire to find that place where we belong. Every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to talk about it or not, is on the same quest to figure out where do I belong? Where do I fit in? How can my soul be satisfied? How can my joy be made complete? And Paul is revealing that our gain is not this world. Our place of belonging is not anything that this world can provide. Our place of belonging is this baby in a manger. And his name is Jesus. He is the light in the dark. And you see what our ultimate gain is heaven. Heaven is where we ultimate belong. Paul wrote this in verse uh, 20 of Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in heaven as we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that baby that was born in the manger is one day coming back again to take those of us who gave our lives to him back home with him. Jesus came for us to realize that where we belong is in his presence. Where we will find our joy complete is in his presence. And like the wise men, when we give Jesus our hope, our time, and our devotion, he will make his joy complete in us. I don't know where you're at, what you've, what's been going on in your life this past year. I don't know if this was a good year or a broken year for you. But no matter what happened this past year or these past few days, my hope is that you realize Jesus is where you belong. Don't buy into the manipulation of this world. But may you realize that the king was born in a manger. And he came to give you life. He came to give you light in your darkened world. He is where you belong. Let's pray together. Father, in this moment, we just come to you. 
Father, I thank you because you are the source of life and goodness. And Lord, I just pray for each person in this room. I just pray right now that you just bless them. Father, I don't know what they've been going through. I don't know what they've been dealing with, whether it's been good or bad. But Lord, in this moment, may they just experience you and your hope. And Lord, may we walk out of this place realizing that this world is not our home. You provide us where we belong. You are the completion to our joy. We praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. 